One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh to live in Midian. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. Moses. Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned. Bring the 
Israelites out of Egypt. And God said, I will be with you. You may clap, they deserve it. Tomorrow night it's parting the Red Sea, so if you bring two buckets of water and a raincoat, we'd appreciate it very much indeed. I do not mean that. Well, we told you that the Prince of Egypt was coming soon. What you didn't know was how soon it was coming. And I hope by now you've picked up our theme which we're running with for each of our celebrations here, both here in the Big Top and also in the, the reflective uh, celebration which takes place at the same time as this um, and also the family celebrations. Um, so you, you have your choice. And by looking at how crowded it is already tonight, some of us are going to need to make that choice. But night by night, we're going to be looking at snapshots from the life of Moses. Why? Why choose those in the light of the fact that our theme this year, which you've found, is past imperfect future tense. That's our kind of theme, past imperfect future tense. What a great description of Moses with an imperfect past and looking at the future and testing where God would take him. We chose it because there's something very unique about this spring harvest. It's the last one in the 20th century. There's nothing you can do about that. This is where we are. But there's something more than just a significant change in date coming. The changes that have come to our society over the past 10 years or so have been huge. And they're going to carry on rushing towards us at an alarming rate. And what we want to do is to see how we can, as the people of God, celebrate his lordship in a changing world. There have been times when very sincere Christians have behaved like, rather like King Canute in the face of the future. They've stood there believing they could change the future. Uh, if you remember back in uh, the days of Joseph, uh, when God gave him the interpretation of a dream, and he came to understand there were going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine, God didn't say, so start praying to change the future. God said, start planning to inhabit the future and to show the quality of my life within it. How are we as the church going to live out the Lordship of Christ, particularly on areas like church, society, uh, and family in the future? That's the issues that we face this year. We're working out some of those issues through the celebrations on Moses, but particularly in our Bible times, our Bible foundations, and what we're calling this year intersections, we take it further. The program at Spring Harvest this year is just as simple to understand as it ever has been. <laughs> Those who've been before mock scoffingly, and you're quite right. Give me one minute, and I'll help you survive the next 24 hours. We, we have a Bible foundation each morning. You can choose whether you do it before coffee or after coffee. It'll be repeated either side. If you turn up to both, you will hear Steve Gorkrodger's joke a second time. You hear it, and he only has one joke, so that's pretty rough. That's a lie. He has two or three, and they're very good because he got them all from me. Um, but he'll be looking at the, the first, uh, at four significant portions from Mark's Gospel, the last period of Jesus' life. Now, the reason you can choose to go either side of the, of the morning break is because intersections, and we've chosen that word because it's the place where the Bible and life intersect. You can choose whether we, uh, from a whole range. Now, what we don't want you to do is to be more confused than you already are. You'll see in your program that you can choose from, for example, family one, family two, family three, that doesn't mean on one day you go to family one, the next day you go to family two, and the next day you go to family three. 
If you think that's a joke, you could see what the bunch last week did with the program we had arranged. So the reason I'm telling you is, I know you look much brighter than them anyway. Well, actually, a little brighter. Um, what you do is you can choose which of three lenses you want to look at the subjects of family, church, and society through. You can choose to look through those three subjects through the lens of family, through the lens of society, or through the lens of church. And you choose your intersection according to the lens you want to look through, and you stay with that intersection unless it's terribly boring, you know, and you would be wise enough to shift. But it won't because our speakers are brilliant. They always are. That's the reason you've come back. How many of you come back? How many of you are here? Good. How many of you were here were at Minehead last year? Thank you for bringing the weather with you. That's very good. Okay. But you, you simply stick with the same intersection. So you choose an intersection according to which lens you're going to look through. And then you stick with it during the following two mornings. We're going to be working to apply those issues to the future and how we can live within the future. And in the afternoons, we've got a whole bunch of, of workshops and seminars which are unpacking in greater detail some of the issues that will have been raised. Do you understand? <laughs> Who does understand? Could you, those of you who don't, just ask these people. <laughs> or if in difficulty, turn up to the little top, session one tomorrow morning, and Stuart Pascal and I will look after you. All right. But it should be as simple as that. Simply choose an intersection according to the lens you want to look through and stick with it for the next three mornings. We're delighted that as we start our series of evenings together and we start to look at the life of Moses. Our speaker tonight is someone uh, you've seen on television, you've read his books, uh, you've queued up for his autograph and we're delighted that our speaker this evening is a, is a long-standing friend of Spring Harvest which we, uh, we count as a, a friend who we respect greatly and uh, we even like him even more because he owns several Bibles and our speaker tonight will be Steve Chalk will come and speak to us in a moment. Steve, we welcome you now. Okay. My name is um, Phil Wall and uh, I'm privileged to be involved in helping to uh, um, oversee and lead the Spring Harvest uh, this week. And um, uh, I just got my name stuck next to introducing Steve tonight and it's a real uh, privilege though to be able to do that. I've been in my uh, current role uh, for nearly nine years now and uh, i was uh, been a police officer before that, that's all I knew really. I've been given this job within the Salvation Army that I work for and really didn't have a clue what it was that I should do. And uh, many people only know Steve as someone who, who stands on platforms, who creates projects, and obviously increasingly in recent days uh, is seen on television screens. But over the last nine years, Steve has consistently done and uh, fulfilled what he said to me nine years ago. I uh, booked an appointment to see a man I just knew a little bit. I said, look, I've got this job. I haven't got a clue what to do. Can you help me? And a man who was intensely busy, and still is intensely busy, said to me on that day, Phil, gave me the advice uh, that uh, I needed and it was intensely helpful and he said, my door is always open for you. And it has consistently been there and I've really appreciated not only the words that Steve had spoken on many times but the heart and attitude behind someone who in the midst of all this busyness has been willing to invest in a loud mouth that really didn't know what he was doing. And I've been greatly thankful to God for that. So it's my privilege to pray for Steve tonight. I said to him, Steve, you know, is there anything you want me to say? And he just said, just say to people, to pray. Would they pray for me? So uh, I'm going to do that. I know that you'll uh, join me in that. Welcome Steve as he comes forward to uh, allow me to pray for him. You would have heard just there from the screen that Steve's mum is here over there somewhere. So uh, it's welcome Mrs. Chalk. Nice to have you here. Anyway, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this dear brother and friend. Uh, Lord, we value him. We care for him. We've been inspired by him. And Lord, we know uh, very, very uh, really that he's not everything that we would always put him up to be. And we don't want to put him on a pedestal tonight, Lord, but we just want to hear something from your humble servant. Father God, inspire his mind, use his words, and do something in and through him, we pray tonight, that will mark out this day as different, this Good Friday, as a different Good Friday than all that we've known before this day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Cheers, Phil. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. That wasn't very good. I know you've come a long way. Good evening. Good evening. 
Now, how many of you actually travelled up the A52 in that giant traffic jam? Did you? You're, yeah, you're the ones that are all asleep. I was in this thing for at least two hours. It's a terrible thing to happen to you, isn't it? So what I'd like you to do, you've not had a chance to uh, say hello to anyone you don't know yet, but I wondered whether, um, as I was travelling up, I was looking at all these cars stuck in this traffic jam for about two hours, I guess it was, and I thought to myself, if I was a car, what kind of car would I be? What kind of car and what kind of engine would I have? And so what I'd like you to do is turn around, uh, uh, greet someone you don't know, um, uh, unless you're with a bunch of people from your church, and then you have to talk to someone you do know. Ask them how they got here, all the rest of it, and then tell them what kind of car you would be if you were a car. What kind of car sums you up? Go for it, and get, find out about them too. <laughs> Right, that's it. <laughs> right, we've got to move on. Okay, okay, uh, you like each other, right? Now I want to do something here. I, uh, I wonder, I wonder how many of you were next to someone who claimed that if they were a car, they'd be something like a Jag or a Bentley or a Rolls or a luxury car. Anybody who sat next to someone like that? Okay, well, turn around and tell them that they're actually a Skoda, right? That's it. <laughs> a little bit too big for their boots. Mind you, I, I did this uh, just recently with some people and uh, a lady I was talking to, she said, I think I'd be a Range Rover. And I thought, God, you know, how, how egotistical is that, a Range Rover? And I said, you know, that's, that's a bit of a boast, isn't it? And she said, no, they're very bulky and they've got a spare tyre on the back. And they're going <laughs> to... And how many of you decided that you would be a Skoda or a Lada or something like that? Well, if for all of those of you who voted for being a Skoda, a Lada or anything even lesser than that, a Robin Reliance, I want to tell you that you're probably more than you think of yourself. You probably are an honest, hard-working Ford. That's what I think, you know, kind of bog-standard Ford. It's incredible, isn't it, when we start comparing ourselves to a car or a piece of machinery or an animal. I'm sure you've all done those little uh, things before. Uh, it, all of our insecurities begin leaking out all over the place. People discover what we really think about ourselves, what we really think of ourselves. But can you imagine not only putting a tag to yourself, but putting that tag on your child? There are some cultures in the world where that happens. So because you feel a certain way about yourself, you don't just call yourself by that name. So you don't just say, I'm tubby, or I'm a bit saggy, or I'm a bit of an old scar face. You actually attach that name to your child. You impose your self-image on them. That's exactly what Moses did in the story that we had read to us. In actual fact, if you were following that in your Bibles from Exodus chapter 2 and Exodus chapter 3, you'll notice that uh, some of the verses, well, it, it was a highlight of the story because there's so much there. But if you've got a Bible, I'd like you to open it now at Exodus chapter 2, Next is just chapter 3, because what I want to do in the next few minutes is lead us through the story and discover something about this man Moses, the prince of Egypt, who went on to lead his people out of slavery and across a desert to the very edge of the promised land. Exodus chapter 2. 
Uh, the story that we've already had read to us picks up at verse 11 and it talks about how Moses kills the Egyptian soldier and then the Pharaoh finds out and then he has to run for his life away from the Pharaoh as fast as he can and he ends up in the desert. But the bit that we didn't read uh, is from uh, verse 21. Verse 21. What actually ends up happening is, uh, as you know, Moses meets up with a gang of people, a family of people, and he marries one of them. Um, he meets a, a man, uh, well, let's read it from verse uh, 21. Moses agreed to stay with a man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him uh, Grisham, saying, I have become an alien in a foreign land. Moses names his son Gershom and he names his son Gershom because he says, I've become an alien in a foreign land. If you've got one of those smart, expensive type Bibles that's all leather bound, you can probably look down at the bottom and you'll see that it says that Gershom in Hebrew sounds like an alien there. Can you imagine that as a name? When I was, um, when I was born, um, my mum fell out with my grandmother. My grandmother wanted me to be called Felix. <laughs> it's absolutely true, absolutely true. My grandmother wanted me to be called Felix and my mother refused to call me Felix and my grandmother didn't speak to my mum for six months because Felix was a family name. If I'd have been called Felix Chalk, I would have been a completely different person to the person I am right now. You can imagine, can't you, that there are certain names that it's really hard to get through those early years with. And Gershom was one of those names. An alien here. It's a, just a lucky job that that film, Alien 1, 2 and 3, wasn't out at the time. Gershom would have had a really tough time with his mates at school. Because Moses took his lack of self-image the bad way he was feeling about who he was as a person and he planted it all on Gershom. He puts it all on his son, an alien here. Because, says Moses, I feel like an alien in a foreign land. I have become an alien in a foreign land. And you know the reason why that was. Moses, the prince of Egypt, realises his true identity. He discovers that he's one of the people of Israel. He looks at them in their slavery, in their brick making. He sees them knocked about. He sees them beaten. He sees them laughed at. He sees them pushed into the dirt. And in the end, he stands up and he says, I must set my people free. And he takes the law into his own hands. An Egyptian is murdered. And then Moses has to run away from the Pharaoh. Moses reaches this place in the desert, looking after sheep, married with a son, and he's feeling so bad about himself that he decides to call his son an alien here. I feel like an alien here. I feel awful. I'm in the wrong place. That might be exactly what you're thinking now, especially after dri having driven through all that traffic, you saw your chalet and you thought, I'm in the wrong place. I'd like to go back anywhere. I'm in the wrong place. That's exactly how Moses felt about things. He was at the bottom. Benjamin Disraeli, one of our most famous prime ministers, said this. He said, to be conscious that you are ignorant is not the bottom of the barrel. It's the first step the first great step to knowledge. To be conscious that you are ignorant is the first great step to knowledge. So when Moses reaches this place, he's a prince of Egypt, miles away from home, truly in the wrong place, working out in the desert as a shepherd, knowing that he's an alien in a foreign land, his heart belongs back with his people, but he's separated from them. By miles and miles and miles, they're a world away. And he says, I'm an alien in a foreign land. I'm a man out of time in the wrong place. But though it feels like he's at the bottom, actually, it's the first step on the way up. There are four steps to learning. I don't know if you know this, but um, if you don't, write them down. It's, they're quite fascinating. The first step to learning is called unconscious incompetence. The next step is called conscious incompetence. The third step is conscious competence and the last step is unconscious competence. Let me explain. 
Unconscious incompetence is when you can't do something, but you're so thick you don't know that you can't do it. <laughs> you're unconscious of the fact that you're totally incompetent. It's like that, isn't it? When, uh, I, I don't know how many of you are mums and dads, but um, I remember when uh, our, our little, um, our, our last lad, when he, was, um, when he was a tiny toddler, he'd lay in the bottom of the bath and he'd swim. And he'd say, Dad, I'm swimming, Dad, I'm swimming. And the water was that deep, did you see? I'm swimming, Dad. He was unconsciously incompetent. He couldn't swim and he didn't know he couldn't swim, so he thought he could swim. But one day, he went swimming in a real swimming pool, and that's when he became consciously incompetent. <laughs> it's the moment when you start drowning. Every kid, every kid knows how to drive, don't they? Oh, Dad, let me drive. I know how to drive. I know how to drive. They're unconsciously incompetent. They haven't got a clue that they don't know what they need to know in order to get the job done. But when you sit behind the wheel of a car for your first driving lesson and you cannot possibly control those three pedals down there, let alone even remember what they're supposed to do, and the gear stick and all the rest of it and look in the mirror, all the rest of it, you realise you're incompetent. That's called conscious incompetence. Moses was on the way up. At the point, he looks at his newborn son and he cannot contain his depression anymore. It's no good hiding it away from the world anymore. So he looks at this new son that he loves and he says, I'm going to call you Gershom, an alien in a foreign land because that's how I feel. I'm a man who's not where he should be and I hate myself and loathe myself because of it. That was the beginning of the way back. Moses reached a desert in order to discover that. You have reached Skegness. <laughs> and it may be here this week, even now, before the week even gets started, before you've listened to anything really, you already know I'm in the wrong place. And I've been on the run for a long time. That's not the bottom. It's the beginning of the way back. It's the first great step forwards. Moses' first great step forward was consciousness of where he was and that he was on, in the wrong place. The second great step forward is to come to the place where you freely and publicly and honestly acknowledge that. The place where I say, Lord, I know I'm not right with you. Consciously, I may, well, I, I, you know, in, in my life, there have been times when I've known that I've not been giving to God what I need to be given to him. I've been conscious of that. It's been niggling away at me, and that's the first step on the way back. But I need to come to that, that point, which is always a struggle for me, where I say, Lord, Instead of it just being a thought in the back of my mind, I'm going to acknowledge that you want me here and I'm over there, that I'm in the wrong place. And the third step on the way back is simply to act. The first step is to become conscious, which is what happened to Moses when he names his son. The second step is to acknowledge that. And the third step is to act on it and begin coming home. We are made in God's image. We can run from God. Most people are running from God. We can run away from home. We can get as far away from him as we like. But actually, God is in us. We are his children. We can never rub that out. I can run away from God. I can tear away from the relationship. But I cannot blot out my history. I am God's child. You can run away, but you can't run for your, from yourself. And that's what Moses discovered. He'd run from that Pharaoh as fast as he could. He'd run to the other side of the map, actually. And now he acknowledges that he cannot actually run from his history. He is one of the people of Israel. He must go back. He must go back. 
But if you look at verse 23 of uh, chapter 2, you'll discover something interesting. It says that Moses names his son Gershom, saying, I've become an alien in a foreign land, verse 22. Then verse 23, during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help uh, uh, went up to God. And God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with, Moses, with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. It was a long time for Moses, that first step of consciousness to the third step where he takes action and he begins on the journey home to face the Pharaoh is a long time. In actual fact, as many of you will know, that long time it talks about in verse 23 is 40 whole years. 40 years! Moses knowing he's in the wrong place. Every time he looks at his son who's grown up to a young man by then, who's 23, uh, who's, who's, who's past that, I was 23 years age, more than that, that's verse 23, isn't it? He's 40 years of age. He's nearly passing 40. He's in a midlife crisis himself. And every time he looks at his son and sees and calls him by the name Gershom, he remembers, I'm an alien in the wrong place. I should be somewhere else. But it takes him 40 years to get round to turning about. As verse 23 tells us, the king dies. As verse 23 tells us, the people of Israel cry out in their slavery, in their bondage, in their suffering. As verse 23 tells us, God hears and he looks down from heaven and he weeps for the suffering and the misery of his people. But Moses is still reaching the place slowly where he's going to take action. And that point comes in chapter 3, verse 1. You got your Bible? Look at it. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert. And they came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in, the flame, in flames of fire from within a bush. Really interesting verse. It says, let me read some of it again. It says that Moses was tending the flock of Jethro and they came uh, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert. In some uh, translations, uh, you may have a translation that says the west side. Uh, most translations say the far side. So why do some translations say the west side and some English translations say the far side? The reason is that the Hebrew actually says, and you know, I went to theological college, so you know, I'm au fait in these languages, Hebrew and Greek. I did quite a, um, you know, I did a little uh, bit of Hebrew, got to know a little Hebrew, got to know a little Greek. Little Greek ran a kebab store down the road, and the Hebrew ran a tailor's. But I did learn just a few words, and actually what the, the Hebrew here actually means, backside doesn't mean far side, it doesn't mean west side, it actually means backside of the desert. That's where Moses was. As you know, these are Moses' books, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, derive from what Moses taught and what Moses said. He didn't actually write all five books in their entirety. He dies near the end of the fifth one, which is very tricky if you've got to write it up yourself. But, uh, but, um, Moses, he dictates many of these stories. We only know this story because Moses passed it on. He was the only person there at the burning bush except a bunch of sheep. They were no good for this. But Moses says, he passes on, I was on the backside of the desert. If you look in your maps in the back of the Bible, in the back of your Bible, if you've got one of those expensive ones where they're all in colour, you'll discover this. That over here, uh, your way around, over here in the map of the Bible is Egypt. And over here is the desert. There's a big sea in between, the Red Sea. And right over here is where Moses was. Moses is so near the crack in the middle of the Bible, if he moved any further over, he would have fallen off the map altogether. Moses is actually saying here, I had got as far away from Egypt and the Pharaoh as it is possible to get. I had removed myself, as read this verse, it always reminds me of the story of Jonah. 
who did exactly the same thing. God said, go to Nineveh. And he said, yeah, okay. So he went the other way. Exactly the opposite direction. That's what happens to Moses here. He's on the backside, the far side of the desert, as far away as you can get. But it's in that desert that God speaks to him through a burning bush. An extraordinary thing. Here we are in Skegness, the middle of nowhere, the backside of the country. <laughs> if we moved any further over, we'd fall in the sea. We are almost off the edge of the map. What an extraordinary place for God to meet people in an oversized tent on the edge of the country in re on reclaimed lands. But Moses had to journey to the far side of the desert and there at a burning bush of all things, God meets him. Maybe this week you've had to travel to Skegness on the A52 for miles and miles and miles and if you moved a few yards over, you'd fall in the sea and this is your burning bush. Big top burning bush. Desert Skegness. <laughs> but God is here because there's nowhere that you can actually run from God. And so, God speaks to Moses in verse 2 of chapter 3. The angel of the Lord appeared to him. Uh, well, God doesn't, uh, God's going to speak, doesn't speak yet. Uh, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up? It's really interesting. This is known as the story of the burning bush. I've been to Sunday school since before I can remember. I've been taught the story of the burning bush so many, 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 many times. But actually, it's not the story of the burning bush at all. The burning bush is absolutely incidental. If you read the commentaries on this chapter, on this passage, they all tell you the same thing. The burning bush, it's just the device that God uses to get Moses' attention finally. He's tried everything over 40 years and Moses has resolutely turned his back on what God's saying. Every time Moses looks at his little lad Gershom, he, he actually says the name, an alien in a foreign land. You would have thought that that would have been enough in the end to drive Moses to his knees and say, Lord, I go back where I should be. I'll face what I've run away from. But for 40 years, Moses puts it off. And finally, God resorts to setting a bush on fire in order to speak to Moses. And that's what it actually says. It says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from him within the bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was burning, it didn't burn up. It didn't burn up. So it says in verse three, so Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? He doesn't say, hey, this is the Lord. I'll just step over there and give myself to him again. Moses isn't interested in God particularly at this point, he's just seen a bush that's burning that doesn't burn. It's pretty extraordinary. It's a bit like people wandering past here and they see a socking great big top in the middle of Skegness. What's it there for? Well, I'll wander in and find out maybe. There's no kind of spiritual longing. It's just an odd thing to see. So Moses wanders over to this burning bush and then in verse 4 it says, When the Lord saw that he'd gone over to take a look, God called to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. Have you ever thought about how God said that? Because, you know, the thing about the Bible, of course, because CD-ROM wasn't available and all the rest of it, we know what God said, but we don't know how he said it. I mean, when God spoke to Moses, when he finally sees him wandering over to the burning bush, and it says, God says to him, Moses, Moses, how does he say it? Perhaps, um, it, you know, God's worried and he's paranoid because, because the people of Israel have been slaves for a further 40 years while Moses has been mucking about with a, a, a bunch of sheep in the desert. Perhaps he says, Moses, Moses, Moses! Over here, quick, Moses! Or perhaps he was angry and annoyed because Moses has been stupidly ignoring him. So he says, Moses! Moses! I thought about this. I challenge you to think about it. 
How did God speak to Moses? How God speaks to us is very important, isn't it? It's not just what he says to us, it's his tone, just as we know about our own relationships. It's not, you know, good enough for me to say to my wife, I love you. (laughs) Thanks for the dinner, I love you. It's how I say it that makes the difference as to whether it's thrown in my face or not, you see? (laughs) It's how we say things that makes the difference. I've got a feeling that when God spoke to Moses, this is how he said it. He didn't say, Moses, 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 we need help, quick. He didn't say, Moses. I've got a feeling he said, Moses, Moses, at last, I've got your attention. Moses, Moses, let's do business together. We are a team. I have plans. I have a purpose for you, Moses, Moses. I'd like you to know that as God speaks to you this week, I believe that's the only way he will speak to you. God speaks to us out of a love that's undying that we can't reach the depths of. God only ever speaks to you out of love. If you feel condemned by God, put down by God, actually it's not God doing it. You may say, yeah, but perhaps I've got real sins in my life. Like Moses, I've run away from God's purposes. Perhaps God's angry with me. Ah, no. When you feel intense guilt that will not go away, that's not God convicting you. It's Satan condemning you. When God convicts me, he always calls me back. And he reminds me that Jesus gave his life on a cross for my forgiveness. It took me a long time to learn that lesson. And it is a real struggle for me every day still. I often hear God's voice that's angry with me. Steve Chalk, why aren't you like this? Why don't you read your Bible more? Why don't you study more? Why aren't you more deep? Why haven't you got more spirituality? Why are you shallow? Why are you so, so lacking in generosity? Why don't you show more love to that person? The person you treated like that, you should have treated like this. And I feel so condemned. And only slowly have I learned that this is never God's voice. Never God's voice. It's Satan's voice who wants to condemn me, put me on the floor and rub me into the dirt to make me feel like dirt and to leave me that way. I am sure, my friends, that many of you this evening actually hear God's voice, God's voice inverted commas often, and God rubs you into the ground because really you're not the kind of Christian he can use and you're in the wrong place and really your level of spirituality leaves so much to be desired. It's no wonder this country's turning its back on the claims of the gospel. I want you to know that is not God's voice. God says, I love you. I love you. God doesn't say, Moses, Moses. He says, Moses, Moses. Now I've got your attention. Boy, I thought I'd never think of something that would do it. But a burning bush, yeah. What a great idea that was. (laughs) Finally, we can talk together. Moses, you're listening. And then God speaks to Moses. And in verse 7, he says this. He says this. It says in verse 7, the Lord said, this is one of my favorite pieces actually of the Old Testament. I just love uh, the balance of these few verses. Let me read them to you. The Lord said to Moses, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering, and so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you. It's fantastic balance, isn't it? I've seen this. I've thought that. I believe this. I want that. So I am sending you, Moses. I am sending you. 
Moses says, as we read together in verse 11, but Lord, who am I? Who am I that I should go? Moses knows his own weakness. You see, he knows he's failed. He knows that 40 years ago, when he was a much younger man, he'd had a go at that Egyptian. He thought that the Israelites would rally behind him. He thought that he could change history. He thought that he would make a difference. He thought his life counted for something. But now he's old and he's tired. He's got track record and he's not proud of his track record. He's failed. Past imperfect. Future tense. My past isn't what I want it to be. My future's tense because I'm an old man and I feel like I've blown it and it's been passed on and other younger people are involved now but there's no room for me anymore. My track record's not what I want it to be. I'm a failure, I've run away. I'm on the backside of the desert and I'm 80 years old. And God says to Moses, but I'm going to send you. And I'm going to send you back where you came from. Back from what you ran away from. I don't know how many of you have come here to Spring Harvest for this week. Actually, if you're honest, running away from your church. You're absolutely fed up with things the way they are. You really don't like the church that God's put you in. In fact, you're hoping that you'll get introduced to some people from a better church whilst you're here. Perhaps God will speak to you in a blinding flash and say, go to St. Peter's and have nothing to do anymore with a Baptist church or something like that. I gave up years ago, all that kind of thing. But God is very, very, very unlikely to say that to you. God didn't say to Moses, Moses, you're a great guy, so I've got a fantastic mission for, for you, and it's on the other side of the world. He said, go back. I am sending you back where you came from, Moses, to face Pharaoh. Moses says, but I can't go. I can't go. There's a story about a famous preacher called Gypsy Smith. I don't know if you've heard of him. But a lady wrote to him and she said, <coughs> God is calling me to be a preacher. Gypsy Smith was a great preacher and lots of people wanted to preach like him. <coughs> she said to him in a letter, God is calling me to be a preacher. God is calling me to preach his gospel everywhere. But unfortunately, he's given me 12 children. Gypsy Smith wrote back and he said, it's very exciting to hear that God has called you to be a preacher and doubly exciting to hear that he's already given you a congregation. We all want to be called to the other side of the world, but Jesus says, begin where you are. Jesus said to his disciples, be, be, be my witnesses First in Jerusalem, where you live, where you failed, he was saying to his disciples. And then in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And we're also keen to get to the ends of the earth and on the big platform and with a big picture. But we're not very keen to be sent back where we came from. To the pharaohs that we run away from. And that's exactly where Moses gets sent. Who am I to go? And he's being honest, is Moses. He's not kind of, well, who am I? God, <laughs> actually, thanks for choosing me. He's saying, who am I? I'm broken. And the truth is that that's why he's so useful to God. His ego has vanished. It's gone. It's away. This is no longer about standing in the right places and being with the right people. It's no longer about power. It's no longer about achieving a career. All of that is gone. All of that's melted a long time ago. And now Moses simply wants to serve, but feels that he can't serve. Feels that he can't serve. And God says... Go back. Our good decisions are the result of wisdom. Wisdom is the result of experience. Experience is the outcome of making bad decisions. So when you look at someone who's wise, you know that they've been there and they've failed and they've blown it and they've picked themselves up and they've learned. And so many of you will be here today, and I include myself very much within that company, and you think, Lord, I've blown it so much. I've let you down so much. I'm so stupid. If only I was brighter and faster and quicker. 
Lord, I've got to places to serve you and I've spent so much time struggling to get there to serve you. In the end, I couldn't remember why I came anyway. Lord, I am not the person you would choose to use. And God says to you, ha ha, you are the person I choose to use. You're the person I choose to use because you're in the right place with me. So go back. The other day I had the privilege of interviewing the chief rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, with whom I had a lengthy discussion about Moses. That man understands Moses. I learned so much from him. And I said to uh, 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 Jonathan as, as we were talking, I said, it's like we learn most from our failures in life. He's a very gracious man. He looked at me and he said, Steve, we learn everything from our failures in life everything that's what God uses to shape us and it was Moses failure and it was his running away that brought him to this place where God could trust him and send him back send him back to face Pharaoh I want to ask you this question who are the pharaohs that you need to go back and face? And I'm looking at my friends back there as much as my friends out here. Because, for instance, you see, I know, well, I know all of these guys. I'm looking at Peter. I know that he has to go back from spring harvest and face, face huge pharaohs, things that he'd love to run away from. I've not talked to him about this, but I'll bet if I, we sit down and have a drink later tonight, he'd say, Steve, I'd love to stay at spring harvest. I'd love to stay at spring harvest because actually there's some big things I'm facing and... It's kind of like a little bit of relief being away. And look at my friend Phil and Stuart and the rest of them, and I know that's true. But God sends us back to face our pharaohs. I want to ask you, who is the pharaoh that God is sending you back to face? You're here at your burning bush in Skegness, your big top experience. Which pharaoh is God pointing you back at? We live in a world where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Just last week, uh, many of you will know that the Treasury themselves issued a report. They say that in the UK, the gap between the poor and the rich, the rich and the poor, has widened over the last 20 years. From 1979 to 1999, the gap has got wider and wider. There are now 12 million people in the UK, mostly in our inner cities who are living below the breadline in absolute squalor and poverty. It's getting wider and wider, 12 million people, 3 million children who are born into poverty and the Treasury say learn poverty from a very young age and can never climb out. Three weeks ago, I was doing some filming and they took me, uh, they took me to an estate near Chester, just on the edge of Chester. And I stood on this estate which was like drug, uh, drug land. I stood on this estate and I played with a young boy, you know, for the, for the cameras. I was playing with this, uh, this, this little lad. And uh, he was three years old and we played around on the streets. They, it, it, looked, it looked like a war zone. There were houses boarded up and there were houses burnt out. And I said, and maybe some of you are from Chester and you don't even know where I'm talking about because, you know, I was amazed that this could exist in a place like that. And I looked down at Jamie in the end and I asked the carer who was with me, who, who, who brought Jamie to me, I said, I said, you know, who is Jamie? Where are his mum and dad? And she said to me, Jamie's dad shot himself at Christmas with Jamie sitting on his lap. In our country, two children die at the hands of their parents every week of the year. The NSPCC, through their full stop campaign, are making that known to us right now. Two little children die at their hands, the hands of their parents, every single week of the year. The World Health Organization said last week that in the next 20 years, the biggest disease worldwide will become depression. The biggest killer in the world right now actually is dysentery. 
across the third world where there's no clean water, where little kids scrape out a living on, through other people's rubble and wreckage. That's the reality. But the biggest disease in the world over the next 20 years is set to become depression. I uh, have uh, recorded a program for Easter Sunday and I interviewed a man who's an atheist. His name's Lewis Wolpert. He's a professor in London, a South African, an incredibly intelligent man who's just written a book called Malignant Sadness. BBC turned it into a series. If you read the papers, everybody refers to it. It's one of the best-selling books in the UK right now. Malignant Sadness. The Samaritans tell us that suicide is now the second biggest killer amongst teenage boys after drunkenness and road accidents. We live in a country where things have gone wrong. We live in a Europe which is at war. We live in a world that's deprived. We live in a world where the poor are poor and they're trodden on daily. And we hand out our little chunks of charity which stink. And chunks of charity that say to this little black kid, hey look, me big white man, I give you something. I'll give you something, shouldn't you be grateful? And he looks up and says, yes, 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 and it keeps him subservient. And it keeps me up there. We need to lift up the poor so they stand on level, uh, level with us. They eyeball us. They are our equals. We need to blow this thing away. So our little bit of giving and our little bit of outreach into the poorest areas of our community just will not do anymore. The fact that the church in the UK has become some kind of middle class institution just will not do, and I know I speak in generalisations, but it will not do, and you know it will not do. God says, who are the pharaohs that you will go to and confront? This is what Christianity is about. This is what we're about. Who are the pharaohs that you will go to and confront? In uh, the, uh, that new uh, thing down there, kind of looks like the mini Millennium Dome down there. I've only just arrived, so I'm not quite sure what it's called, the pavilion or something, but you know what I mean, don't you? In that mini uh, Millennium Dome, there are actually four projects. Y2000, Fanfare for a New Generation, Man for, uh, the, Man for the Millennium, and another project down there, which are all about how we get ourselves geared up for the Millennium. Listen! I read my paper just the other day, the Evening Standard, and, uh, and, and we're told that the church isn't going to have its place in the Millennium Dome, and that Archbishop George Carey and that Cardinal uh, Basil Hume have said they won't turn up at midnight for the big shindig on the 31st of December unless they have their place in the Dome. I think we should be fighting for a place in the Dome, but get, let's get it right. The real Millennium Exhibitions aren't going to be in the Dome, they're us. If your church is not a Millennium Exhibition, if you're not a Millennium Exhibition, the church has had it. We can have the most all singing, all dancing, 3D whiz thing happening down there in that big hole in Greenwich and it will count for nothing. Nothing unless people can visit your church and it's a Millennium Exhibition to the power of Jesus Christ that transforms lives. That's what it's about. This is such an important point in history. There is no one else. There's, God's not going to send anyone over the horizon. There are not a new set of church leaders out there, a new set of youth leaders out there. There's no one else who's going to suddenly turn up and do it for us whilst we sit there and look at our nails. The reality is it is us. We are the Christians at the end of the second millennium. We are the leaders at the beginning of the third millennium. We must go back and face the Pharaoh. We've got to get out of the back of the desert. We've got to get out of looking after a bunch of sheep. We've got to get out of being in a foreign land. We've got to go back from our big top experience in Skegness back to the Pharaoh and challenge him. And God says, as you do that, I will be with you. I've run out of time. Peter told me I've got to finish by 20 past, so I'm just finishing. So if you want to go, I will finish with this statement. Two facts. Um, one challenge. Two facts. This story of Moses is the story of the fact that God gets hold of disappointed and inadequate people. People who feel they've got nothing to do, give. And he says, I want to do business with you. 
Fact number two. God says, not only do I want to do business with you, I want you to go back to those pharaohs. But he then says, I will be with you. That's how our passage finishes. God, and Moses says, but who am I? Who can I? How can I go? And God says, I will be with you and I will empower you. You're not going on your own. I will be with you if you go back, because that's where I want you. Back, not running away. They're the two facts and one challenge. The challenge is this. Is this your burning bush experience. And who is the Pharaoh that you must go back and face? Thank you. It's interesting this year as a team we've been um, saying, you know, where we got a day shorter this year, uh, where we normally end up at the end of night two, we need to be at the end of night one for all sorts of communication reasons. And so you could think that what I'm about to say is, is all about quickening the process so we get it all done in the spring harvest week. But we sense very strongly before God, and I hope you accept that as a statement of integrity and authenticity, that God has brought some issues right to the fore tonight. That maybe you would work through three or four days down the line. But God, right at the very beginning of this week, has laid before us some significant challenges. And uh, for those that are able to stay, we have plenty of time to worship and pray and think through what Steve has so powerfully put before us tonight. Running from God is a common experience. And there are a number of ways that we've run from God that we want to lift up before you tonight to consider where you are. And I want to begin tonight, and I hope appropriately, for those of you that have been literally running from God. You may be one of what we call the spring harvest draggies. You've been dragged here by your spouse, or your friends, or your family. And you've struggled for years to come to terms with the Christian life of your friends and your family and your spouse. You, you struggle for ages. But behind the awkwardness and sometimes the conflict in those situations, behind maybe your intellectual objections, behind maybe the hurt that you've had where you felt you've been the second choice and second best to the church and the God thing. Behind all of that has been this nagging, gnawing sense of being in the wrong place. Oh, certainly, you felt justified. And maybe you have been. And certainly, you've maybe been hurt. And maybe, true, you have been. And certainly, all those things are there. And you felt justified. But actually behind all of that is a gnawing angst that your position is untenable. You just, like the man Moses, this man of history, are in the wrong place. And maybe you've been a churchgoer for years. You've been playing the game, wearing the mask. You know when I do this at the right time and you... You know when to go to church and you know when to say amen or when not to say amen. You know the rules. You read the script. But maybe tonight is the night to come clean. And so what we'd like to start off this evening is this. We're going to come back to this song in a second. Just want to invite those of you who tonight need to make a response to that gnawing sense of not being in the right place. And the right place isn't necessarily an all singing, dancing, jumping kind of thing that you've maybe seen here tonight. The right place before God, as Steve said, is a position and a condition of the heart. And I want to invite those of you tonight that would not as yet call yourself a follower of Jesus. Or maybe have played the game for years but want to become an authentic follower of Jesus. To come out from your seat and come down the front here. To take your first step towards the burning bush. Maybe this is your burning bush. And say, I know I need to be in a different place to the one that I've been for all these years. You may not have all the answers to your questions. You may not have all everything sorted out. But God is more concerned with the attitude of your heart and the position of your will than he is your intellectual understanding. So I want to give opportunity as we sing this song together after I've prayed. For those of you that tonight either want to come clean with God and stop playing the games, or for those of you, and I speak particularly 
for those of you who are spouses of people that are Christians and you're here graciously, I hope not under too much duress, to respond to the angst that maybe in private you know has been there so powerfully this night. And just come forward and by saying, coming forward, you're saying to God, God, I know I need to be in a different place. I'm just going to ask you to come over here to my right. Not many people see you because of the way the lights are. And some of our team here, the speaking team that are here and some of the people on the platform will just come and encourage you. I won't do anything weird to you. Just come and encourage you and pray with you as you choose to put yourself in a different place. So I invite you to do that. I'd like to pray for you. I'd like to pray that God would guide you in these moments as the butterflies do triple cell codes within your stomach. Just pray that God will give you the courage to move to a different place on this night. We're going to pray. God, I want to pray for every man and woman in this tent that, well, firstly, needs to come clean. Those that have been playing the game. They've played by the religious rules, Jesus, but they've never given their life into your hands. And I pray that tonight, Lord, irrespective of what those around them might think or feel, that they would come forward and give their life into your hands. And I pray particularly, Lord, for those spouses, those friends here, that although they've always chosen not to be in that place, have known they needed to be in a different place. And tonight, Jesus, I pray, you would give them the courage to stand up and come forward to the different place, God, that you would have them be to begin a new start, a fresh start in a different place. Holy Spirit of God, please now, would you prompt those people to respond to what within themselves they know is the right thing to do. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, I'd invite those of you to come out, stand up and come out. The rest of us remain seated for now. And just stand here and the team will just come and stand with you and pray with you. If the lights could be on the stage rather than down here, that would be immensely helpful. This is difficult enough for people. We'd like to make it as accessible for you as possible. You come now as we sing. Thank you. Please do come as we sing. Thank you. to come with a friend you may want to come with a spouse and say look would you come with me this is all very new and fresh for me so please don't feel you have to come on your own and you just to continue to come now I know it's difficult I know it's challenging come and join the brothers and sisters over here that uh, have said and they've heard God tonight I will need to be in a different place so you just come come your friends come your spouse come whatever just come here now if you would but what about the rest of us 
What about the rest of us that have been in the desert for all these years? We're Christian, yeah, we belong to Jesus. Moses was God's man, that was never much in doubt. But we know we're in a different place. Come over here, my dear. And um, we need to be in a different place. And God has maybe brought you here to spring harvest this week. So that you might not see the burning bush because you're already here now. God has got your attention. But so that you might hear him call your name and move to the different place that God would have you be. I'm going to invite you to do this and then we're going to pray for all of you here. If you know, you sense within your spirit that you have been in the desert, you have been running, you felt yourself, if you like, on the back side of things, God would want to encourage you tonight to do what Moses did and to recognize that this is the place that you are. You are on holy ground. And I want to invite you to do one of two things. To either take your shoes off physically or metaphorically. If you haven't take, changed your socks for a few days, please do it metaphorically. And then I want to invite you to stand to say, God, I recognize, I see, I hear you. I see the burning bush. God, you've got my attention and I've taken off my shoes and I'm here, God. I'm here as someone that wants to go back and face and confront those pharaohs. I'm here, God, not because I want to escape, but I'm here with my shoes off standing because I want the strength and the grace and the wisdom and the understanding and just the sheer courage to be equipped this week to go back and face my pharaohs. And so if that's the place that you recognize yourself in this night and that's the place that you want to be, then here in our burning bush, I invite you as you worship and then we'll pray again to take off your shoes, physically or metaphorically, and stand, saying, God, I'm here. Here I am. Speak, because I am ready in my weakness and in my sense of inadequacy to go and face my pharaohs. If that's what you want to say to God this night, I invite you to respond in the way that I've described. Thank you. The great I Revealed to man Take off your shoes This is holy ground The great I am Reveal to man Take off your shoes This is holy ground If you wish to respond this way, would you please take your shoes off or and stand and stand there Holy ground I'm standing on holy ground for the Lord my God is here with me For the 
together in a moment. I just want to say to those of you that are, have come over here already and have gone back to your seats, or those of you for whom this was just a bit too much tonight, but you know you need to be in a different place, I want to invite you tomorrow to go to uh, the centre that's been set up especially to give time for people to talk and think these things through in KB1, tomorrow after 10 o'clock in the morning, KB1, it's a chalet, KB1, go there tomorrow if you would. We know these things are embarrassing, uh, sometimes are quite difficult. Just realised I've got holes in my socks, that's quite embarrassing. But um, we just want to say, please, we ask you, we beg you to respond to the voice of God. If you've got questions about that, if you're not sure, then just come and grab us at the end and say, look, I sensed something, but I wasn't quite sure what it was. Can you, can you just help me think this through? We are here to serve you. I don't want to humiliate anybody, but we do want you to embrace God's best for your life. So we want to invite you to do that. I'd like to have the privilege of praying for those of you that have stood. And actually, I'm going to ask Steve to come if he would pray. For those of you that have stood tonight before God and say, God, I'm here on holy ground. I'm here on, forgive me, holy ground. And I want to hear your voice. And I want to respond. And I want to go back at the end of this week to confront my pharaohs, to fulfill your will for my life. Let's pray. So Father, here we are, your people. We want our lives to count for something. Not just anything, we want them to count for you. We want to go back. We want to be equipped while we're here, but to go back to face difficult situations in your strength. We thank you for the contacts you've given us, for the communities that you've placed us in for the neighbours that are ours, for the friends and family that are ours, for our churches. We thank you for our towns, the villages, the cities that we come from, the people that we work with, the places that we serve, the schools that we're part of, colleges that we're part of. Lord, we want to bring the truth of who Jesus is to the people that we're close to. We want to bring liberty. We want to bring freedom from oppression. We want to bring joy. We want to tell people of abundant life, full life. To bring forgiveness in Jesus' name. Send us back to serve, back to our places of work, back to our churches, back to our families, to serve you. Amen.